Uh, I'm Don Ritchie. I'm the Senate historian. I do an oral history project with former senators and former Senate staff. Well, oral history has always been technologically driven. Uh, people used to record on paper with pens before there was any kind of recording device, and then big wire recorders came along, and then after that, reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders, uh, and then cassette tape recorders. And each time it got a little more mobile and portable and uh, easier to, to handle, uh, more people used it. Uh, and so this is a progression that's come right on up into the digital era. Uh, I, when I wrote uh, Doing Oral History, the first edition in 1997, I talked about the tape and the transcript. By the time I came up with the second edition in 2003, people weren't using tape anymore, so I had to talk about the recording and the transcript. And I discovered that the, the basic fundamental practices of doing oral history have not changed. The face-to-face -face interviews, the types of things you need to do to research and to, uh, to engage a person and to draw them out and to ask a, a non-leading questions, open-ended questions and things like that, that stayed the same regardless of what the technology is. But everything around it changed. And once you change the way you recorded those interviews, it once digital uh, made not only audio recordings easier, but video recordings easier, and did away with the lights and the need for a big crew of people to work on it. Uh, people could in broaden their scope to in include video. Uh, and then also, once they had collected the interviews, they could think of new ways to disseminate them, to get them out. Uh, for years, we used to produce transcripts that were bound or not bound, but they were put on library shelves. And maybe, you know, 10 people a year might look at that book on the library shelf. Uh, now, people put their entire transcripts and sometimes their full uh, audio up online. And you get thousands of hits sometimes on, uh, on a monthly basis. And in addition, you can read what your colleagues are doing in other universities. For years, I went to conferences and heard people talk about how to do an oral history interview. For the first time, I actually got to read how they actually did oral history interviews and discovered a lot of them didn't practice what they preached, actually. Uh, but and it wasn't just people in the United States. I can read interviews in England or in South Africa or in Australia. Uh, English, fortunately, is a large amount of the amount of oral history that's available online. Uh, but you can really f follow oral histories in every continent. And so uh, we're, we're thinking constantly about once we've got it, what can we do with it? Uh, we're using it a lot more in museums right now. Uh, most museums here in Washington, you go in, there's a video. You can sometimes ask questions of a person. They've recorded the questions and the answers are there, but you, you choose from a template of questions. Uh, there are all sorts of other ways in which uh, those interviews are incorporated. The Holocaust Museum has is, is, uh, always been a uh, sort of pioneer in this. They have both the audio interviews and the video interviews. It's a very different experience listening to the two at different places in the museum. And it connects people. They, you know, in addition to looking at the artifacts, you hear from people who experience that. And that's, of course, one of the reasons we do oral history is to hear from the firsthand observers, to the, the participants in the events. Uh, it's just well beyond anything that we were able to do before. It's interesting for me now, having been doing interviews for about 30 years, to hear some of the interviews, the tapes that I did back in the 1970s and 1980s that have been really augmented by the, the digital recording that got rid of all that background noise. The voice sounds crisp. It sounds like the person's in the room with you when you're listening to it. And it's easier to understand what's happening. But the, the more we have that technological advantage, the more we're going to think about how we can use it and the more creative we're going to be in that. And that's probably in, when I write another edition of Doing Oral History, the part of the book that's going to change the most is the last chapter on presenting oral history because uh, you know, we're going to be thinking of new ways of using this technology, which is evolving, which will change as we're doing it. Uh, it will open up all sorts of new avenues for putting those interviews back into the communities where we took the interviews for spreading them out even further. And the uses and the, and the forms of presentation are going to change according to the technology.